This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. For more great podcasts, head over to BigHeadsMedia.com. This week on a new TV Tuners, Stairmaster gets his vaccine shot. Where is it, bro? How many years will it take, bro? And Keoran and Swanson enter a submarine. Swanson, we're taking water. Why? We just got in. We just got hit. The enemy's here. Ugh. No! All that and more on a new TV Tuners! Tuners. It's a television podcast for the true fanatics. It's a weekly dive in the latest in TV news and reviews. I'm your host, Swanson. With me, as always, is my co-host and uh, lovable dad who's got some very high standards. Here Swanson. Swanson, you should never kill. Never kill, even when they're going to die anyway. Just don't, don't, Swanson. Hey, e- even if they've killed us, you don't kill. Don't, don't kill. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> There's a code. I've got a, I've got a loosely defined moral code. We never kill. Never. I'm like Superman. That's why we don't kill. Okay. I'm like Superman, but even better. I get mad when other people kill, and it wasn't me. I'm Superman, but I've got a bad wig the whole episode. It's just bad I, wigs all the way down for me. And I'm old. Uh, yeah. Uh, welcome to the pod for another exciting edition. Uh, Stairmaster is on assignment. Uh, he is not here today. He's busy. He's working on a yeah, special like, project known as Gundam. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Like, he's been all wrapped up in this technology... He's working with this guy. His name is like Minov Sky or something. Yeah, th- I don't know. These names don't really make any sense to me. But, uh, no. you know. I think they're made up names. I think Stairmaster is having like, what do you call it when like you don't uh, meld with reality anymore? Like you're just completely delusional and. Dementia? No. I guess dementia. dementia. I, I think it's like schizophrenia, right? That's the disorder. Uh, that's, yeah, that's probably true. Yeah, he's having like a delusional episode. Yeah, so we're just going to let him play it out and uh, we're going to record the episode. Yeah, it seems like a healthy reaction to that for us. Yeah, I mean, we live with him, so we know how to deal with his episode. We do? Yeah. This is how we deal with it, by ignoring it. And I can oh, not okay. really a problem. Yeah, it's not really a problem. He'll be back next week and he'll be normal. Yeah. I mean, it's a classic stair catchphrase, I'm normal. Yeah. Why would he lie if he... Why would he say something untrue like that? He wouldn't. That's that's the answer, Swanson. You, you got exactly. it. Perfectly normal guy. Uh, so, yeah. Welcome to CV Tuners, where we talk about the latest and greatest in TV. Uh, and that's certainly the case this week. We have an email... Yeah, we'll talk about the email though, because you know, Twitter—that's a—that's an old man's game. Email is where it's at nowadays. <laughs> the kids People they are doing, love email. There's millions of emails being made every day, Swanson. Can you believe it? I would even say maybe billions. I I can't really count them. Yeah, they. Uh, it's great. It sounds. I mean, it sounds great to me. I don't know about you, Q, right? Well, what kind of emails do we get? Well, we get emails from all over the world, uh, but if you have any quips, comments, questions, foresights, otherwise, you can send any of that to us at our email address, tvtunerspodcast at gmail.com, and uh, it'll we'll read it aloud here on the pod. 
No way. You're out of your mind, Swanson. Yeah, we'll do that very thing. Okay, that sounds like a lot of fun. Why? Does, if you're listening right now, send us an email because we, we want your email. We want it bad. Like, we're jonesing for it right now. Yeah. So, well, what's that email, Kieran? Uh, TV Tuners Podcast at gmail.com. That's right. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the many ways that you can keep in touch with your good pals, Swanson, Keo Rain, and Stairmaster, except for right now. And Pumpkin. Uh, yeah, sure. Sure. That guy. Yes. Pumpkin 2.0. Ooh. Uh, all right. That sounds good to me. Cyber Pumpkin. All right, I do have a tweet that I just found. Do we want to do? Do we want to? Do we want me to talk about it? Yes. All right. It's it's a tweet of the week. I think it's it's that caliber. Okay. Uh-huh. Well, what is it? All right. So this tweet is courtesy of uh, Arbiter Wolfgang on Twitter at Arbiter Wolfgang. What in the world is this? Hashtag Jupiter's Legacy. And it is a a, a screenshot. <laughs> Of uh, the the dark seed esque uh, bad guy who shows up at the end of this episode of Jupiter's Legacy. Yeah, it it's like if um, here's what it is. It's if somebody was telling somebody else what dark seed looked like, and they had to just write like draw it from the description, and then that's the concept art they used to make this uh, whatever this is. Yeah, it's not just if someone did it. It's like if a five-year-old told you what Darkseed looked like. He's a man, and he's got really crinkly skin, and he's got big metal shirt on, and big shoulder pads, and in his in his shirt, he's got a yellow circle, and he can punch, and he's really bad, and he doesn't like you, and he wants to kill the whole planet. And it's never explained, but he's mad. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah that's, tune I in mean, on this tweet. This is excellent. This is just the kind of content I want to see out there. Thank you, yeah. Arbiter Wolfgang. Thank you so much. Yes, tune in on that. And if you enjoyed right. our commentary there, come on, check out our podcast, TV Tuners. That's right. Uh, yeah. And... That, that, that's that's all well and good, but Kiorain, let's get to the meat of the situation here. What'd you watch this week? Anything fun? Interesting? Oh boy. Um, so here, I guess we're kind of doing an anime thing lately, aren't we? Yeah, we've been watching a lot of anime, mostly Gundam. Yeah, our brains so... have been uh, our brains have been completely overtaken by uh, Tomino, uh, Mister Tomino's work. <laughs> yeah, our good old friend Tomino. Yeah. So friend of the pod. Yeah, I look, here's the deal. I ran out of Gundam to watch because we were going to watch uh Mr. Char's Counterattack and I didn't want to just watch it too early before like Swanson does. So yeah. Swanson getting through Zeta. I'm waiting for him to catch up. He needs to like, you know, hurry up. He's do going way too slow, unlike me, who's very healthy in, in my television consumption. Yeah. I I I mean, hey, I'm on episode uh 4. Wow. I got the episode four in like one night easily. Well, uh, I mean, I guess we can talk about Zeta unless you have something you want to talk about that you watch. Yeah. I, okay. I, I'll, I'll talk about an anime that I fully caught up on in too fast of time. Oh, okay. Uh, Noticing a trend. <laughs> yeah. So Swanson, you don't watch anime. You're not an anime guy at all. I feel like I'm slowly similar to how when we started the podcast, you were the TV novice, and now by cultural oh. os- by osmosis from the pod, you're you're slightly less of that. I'm still the TV novice of the podcast, though by far. Uh, well, yeah, but I mean, you are you now. I feel like know about as you know like as much as like a random person who doesn't really pay that much attention to TV. Yeah, I guess possibly. You know more probably at this point. Yeah, probably. Uh, yeah. 
I feel like I've become more attuned to the world of anime at, at this point. Not any, not okay. really recently, though, I guess. I, I'm just watching old animes. All right, so I've got a question for you. Um, what do you think an isekai is? Uh, hmm. Oh. Like a mentor figure. <laughs> um, I have no idea what that word would be. Um, usually you call a teacher's senseis, I think. Well, you, there's lots of words have different meanings. Yeah, that's true. But isekai is not even close to that. All right, but uh, if I tell you what the trope is, you'll, you'll you'll probably recognize it. It's basically when a character wakes up and they're in a different world that's unlike their own. Oh, uh, okay. So, uh, trying to think of an anime that was like that. I guess not. Uh-oh. I guess, uh, I don't know. Inuyasha wasn't like that, I guess, technically. Inuyasha is kind of an isekai, except uh, Kagome didn't wake up there. She traveled there, but it's, it's very similar, right? Yeah. So, she's in a world that's unrelated to her own for the most part. It's like, a new new world to hang out in and there's like a a guy who she did she gets a crush on etc so yeah, that's kind of nice a, a 500 year old demon yeah normal stuff <laughs> so there's a there's a lot of those now swanson there's like a lot which is basically the fact that you don't know what one is tells me that you're like not like you don't you're still an anime novice to a very strong degree swanson well, what can I say? Listen, you know, I, I like what I like, and I like <laughs> big robots fighting. Yeah, so I I was just kind of bored, and it was 3 a.m., and I watched some anime. I, I picked up a random one, and um, it follows the current trend of having anime titles that are, like, really long. So I believe the title of the one I watched is So I'm a Spider... So what? Yeah, that's what it's called. So is this like the is this like a sister series to I'm a slime and I'm married to another slime and this slime is my sister? <laughs> yes, exactly. I don't know if it's related to it or not, but it, it's in that same trend. Okay. So see, you, you know what an isekai is. That's that's another isekai. Um, yeah, this person was re uh, reincarnated as a spider. And it was actually a lot better than I thought it would be. I was just watching it because I was just like curious. What are, they, and, are they just doing like spider stuff? I don't want to watch an, anime spiders. I don't like. I like spiders are fine to be around. Like, I'll, if I see a spider, I'm not going to kill it. But I don't want to watch spiders do stuff. It's a spider that's in like um, an RPG world. It's like a fantasy spider. Oh, all right. I guess so, that's a little less frightening. And she has like a cute anime face rather than a spider face. Okay, so it's not about, like, a spider, like, capturing someone in a web and then slowly digesting them from the inside out. No, no, it's it's about a spider who's, like, a cute girl, but looks like a spider just with a cute girl's face, I guess, Mm -hmm. who's, like, leveling up and, like, fighting things, who was reincarnated from a person who died in the real world. Now we're in the fantasy world and, like, uh... You know, she has to struggle to live in, like, the... She, for whatever reason, she spawned in, like, the the final boss dungeon as, like, the weakest creature in the game. The quote-unquote ga- quote unquote game, because it's not really confirmed to be a game, even though it has, like, literal RPG mechanics. Right. Interesting. So, yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really, like... It's just on the nose, and it's kind of fun. The character never stops talking in, in, in like, this internal dialogue monologue i guess but actually it is a dialogue because at some point she gets an ability called parallel minds where she has like three other versions of herself that she talks to but um as far as the show i watched goes i enjoyed it although i could see somebody being annoyed with it also a lot of the fight scenes are driven by very like not very high quality cg but i don't know the, the events that play out are like pretty pretty fun so and also really satisfying to like see this character succeed uh, should I should I talk about what I watched? Uh, yeah, Swanson, you should talk about what you watched. This is a what you boys watch this week, and you're one of the boys. Uh, I watched Zeta Gundam. Oh yeah, what'd you think of the first four episodes you watched there? Uh, we're getting into some sad boy territory right off the bat, but uh, 
like on episode three, like his parents are dead. <laughs> yeah, like that's like like Amro like didn't lose anything really. I mean, yeah, like he lost relationships with his parents, but his mom and dad were still alive at the end. Yeah, and he we have we got our boy Camille just losing everything. Just episode three, yeah, he's got to keep on going, keep on going at it there. It's wild. Um, already the animation's a huge step up. Uh, the op- the music kicks ass. The music's like some of my favorite. I think it might. I mean, you know, I'm good. I don't want to jump the gun, but I think it's already getting close to being a front runner for best just overall anime soundtrack. Yeah, it, it's really good. I, I don't know uh, where I'd rank it in terms of anime soundtracks in general, but yeah, definitely pretty pretty good stuff. And yeah, and you talk about Sad Boy Territories once, and they just uh, I don't know <laughs> they they barely got started on this one once, and barely gotten started. I um. I, I do love that, despite going by a different name, the show n- wants you to know immediately that this is Char. Oh, yeah. Um, and even the characters, they know that pretty clearly. They're just like... Every time they see the, him, they're just like, that's the Red Comet! Yeah, like, they bring it up. They're like, that's that's Char Asnable. That's the guy right there. And he's like, oh, well, I don't go by the name that name right now you can call me quattro and they're like oh i i guess like i guess you're gonna fight on our side so we'll respect that for now i don't know camille punches them a couple times it's pretty pretty fun i haven't gotten in, in, into any camille punching yet but uh there is like a weird sort of uh brotherly perhaps fatherly relationship going on between the two of them that seems to be forming yeah uh char acts as a mentor and uh, he generally acts like a good person throughout the whole thing. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, I'm liking uh, I'm liking pseudo good guy Char right now. Yeah, it's it's, it's weird. It's surreal. Yeah. Uh, also, his new design is very very good. <laughs> it's it's iconic. Just one of the most iconic anime designs you could imagine, right? Yeah. It was. It, it's like uh, they were like you know original Char, very cool look. But what if we made them even cooler? And they're like, sunglasses will help. Well, and they did help. Yeah, and a I, lot. I don't know. And the sunglasses are also like, they're shaped in like an, I don't know, they're kind of emotive, aren't they? Yeah, it's weird how, despite him wearing sunglasses for any time he's not piloting a mobile suit, you can still get the feel for what emotion he has currently. Yeah. Not happy. Definitely not happy. <laughs> no, most of the time, very unhappy, actually. Yeah. Uh, you know, he seems like a person who's uh, been dealing with a lot of things that he's not actually focused on. He's got a lot of un- unseated issues that maybe he needs to deal with in his life. Yeah. Now let's. Hopefully he deals with them in a very healthy way coming forward. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, anyway, yeah, it's a great show. Um, I love, I'm sure it's going to get even more incongruous as the show gets more in the sad boy territory, but I love the cliffhanger ending followed by like a real peppy, upbeat ending song. <laughs> yeah. Which is Haro yeah. bouncing along. Yeah, I can't help believing you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was it, especially it's... egregious, like. Camille's mom dies and he's crying and the episode ends and then it's just I cannot believe in you. <laughs> it's just like oh, oh all right. Yeah, I, I I don't know if that was a conscious decision on their part, but it it doesn't let up. It's just like sad boy stuff happens and then that song starts playing and then that song just becomes a sad song itself. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Yeah. Anyway, good show. I'd recommend. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, already, I think it's on pace to probably be a step up from the original series, which I enjoyed. Uh, all right, well, let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and move on to the rabble, huh, Kieran? Yes, the rabble. I'm I'm ready for the rabble. Uh, the rabble is a segment here on the show where before we go and talk about the TV show we watched this week, we give you a little sneak peek by looking at what people on IMDb. And people on Rotten Tomatoes have to say, uh, by people I mean critics, of course, 
they would hate to be referred to as just people. <laughs> uh, what they have to say about the show that we watched this week, Jupiter's Legacy. But wait a minute, Kiorain. That wasn't the only show. A little bit of a blunder I made this week. I don't know how. I think I'm probably still sleep deprived. I don't know. But um, I watched a different show. <laughs> It was also yeah. a Netflix show in my defense, but I watched a show that we previously considered watching but didn't. I watched Shadow and Bone. Right. So we're actually discussing two separate shows because you watched uh, the fir- the opening scene and like the ending bit of Jupiter's Legacy on my uh, insistence. And I decided to watch the opening five minutes of Shadow and Bone. So we both yeah, have a so- general understanding of both shows. A, a very tertiary, just general <laughs> sense of what those yeah. shows entail. And then I guess I later watched... in this pod, we're going to give the full rundown for each other. <laughs> yeah. Um, so are we going to cover all the review stuff for both shows then? Uh, I don't have any IMDb's for Jupiter's Legacy. I, I can probably find one real quick. I found Wait, one. I why found don't you one. start? I found one for Jupiter's Legacy. Um, oh, all right. Then I'll uh, I'll look up uh, Rotten Tomatoes real quick here. Uh, why don't you start us off, Kyo? All right. Um, I'll go ahead and start with the show I did watch because I... Look, can I be greedy this week, Swanson, please? Mm, sure. Okay. Because I picked out five reviews here. Oh. Yeah, but don't worry. Some of them are really short. That's why I picked out more than a few. All right. So I've got three negative reviews and two positive reviews here for... Uh, Shadow and Bone. All right. All right. So um, I'll start with the really short ones, and then I'll get to the long ones. All right. um, So the first review I got here is a 1 out of 10, and it's titled Rubish. (laughs) (laughs) Utter Rubish. (laughs) And um, I didn't get to the best part of this review. So this was written by... Clitorious B.I.G. All right. Well, agreed then. It is rubbish. <laughs> and uh, it's, who um, am I to, to disagree with Clitorious B.I.G.? You can't. And uh, the review reads, don't watch. What after first episode? I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, tells it like it is. Yeah, one out of five found this helpful. Ooh, all right. Okay, here's another one out of ten. Uh, it's titled "This Show Solved My Insomnia" by X three five four seven four, and it has a big red warning here. Warning: spoilers. Uh oh. And it says it is so boring it allows me to fall asleep within the first fifteen minutes. First 15 mins? Minutes. Wow. It's, it's abbreviated. Well, I know, but... Dang. I need that kind of yeah. sleep aid sometimes. Yeah, me too. Uh, 7 out of 28 found this helpful. Seven out of 70 out of 128 found this helpful. Oh, wow. All right. Lots of people agree with that one. They were getting sleepy. <laughs> yeah, they were like, wow, sleep aid for me? Sorry, right, um, uh, how do I sign up? Do I like? I'll click it just in case. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 10 out of 10 uh, that says Wowzers by M.N. John Man. Oh, yeah. Classic John Man. <laughs> <laughs> it says, what an outstanding fantasy series. Great writing, storylines, and acting. The show had a little of everything. Yeah, all those those are all the things you want, right? Yeah, well, when you're looking for a show, uh, you look at the premise and you say, oh, I bet you that has the the three things I need. Writing, acting, and some other thing he said. Storylines. Sto- <laughs> Which is different from writing, of course. Yes, different. Uh, they're very distinct. Okay, five out of 11 found this helpful. Oh, All right, not, um, so not now- quite the sleep aid that uh, the other one was. Yeah. All right. So here is my long one out of 10. And this one just sounds like something we would have said about a show. Actually, it's literally something we said about a show before. All right. It says, this must be machine generated by SMIG QNQKZQ 
Oh, that's machine generated there for sure. All right. Um, I couldn't make it more than 10 minutes into this first episode. I felt like I was being force-fed moldy leftovers from every science fiction and fantasy movie from the last 20 years. Orphans? Am I watching a series of unfortunate events? Oh no, that wall. Is this Maze Runner? Game of Thrones? Wait, is that rabbit a demon? Is his dark materials now? No, no, I'm getting a Hunger Games vibe now. Just just doing a running commentary of popular things from the last 10 years. I, I guess. There's just so much thematic overlap with so many other recent and popular stories that I can't help feeling that Netflix hired a machine learning algorithm to put together the screenplay and is now using it to test the viability of its upcoming computer-generated programming. Six out of ten found this helpful. Were it not based on a novel, I would believe them. Yeah. Uh, we, <laughs> what show was it that we said that before? Was it Mr. Mayor? Was that it? Mr. Mayor was the show that we thought was written by an AI. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, it, and for all we know, it might still be, and they just haven't revealed it yet. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Here's my last review for Shadow and Bone. I'll try to be quick with this one, so I'm going to speed read this one. This is a 10 out of 10. It says, amazing show, smart, elegant, powerful, mysterious, uh, by Jir Zabala. I don't know how to pronounce that name. All right. This show is amazing. And Archie Renault, Mal, wow, my man. My what a man. handsome fella. Such a gorgeous man. Every time I saw his face, I felt butterflies in my stomach. Uff. The Alina Uff. actress is a very lucky girl. But okay, coming back to the show, the cinematography was astounding. The costumes, decor, mansions were like those old 90 classical movies, 90s classical movies, that we don't see anymore. Uh, oh, so nostalgic. Uh, huh. What? A lot of mystery, puzzles, religion, politics, war, conflicts, character development, originality, twists, decent script... Powerful love story. I mean, come on! How can you rank with a low note to this? you got to ignore a lot of facts to rank this show low. It's beautiful and artistic product! Kyo, uh, what's your favorite 90s classical film? Uh, I plead Lion the fifth King? on that one. Yeah, Lion King, there we go. Yeah, because it's a, just a great classical film. You know, I'm fond of Forrest Gump, that classic film, that classical film. Yeah. 90s classical movies that we don't see anymore. Yeah, we don't see those 90s classical movies anymore, you know, like uh, Pulp Fiction. We don't see them, Swanson. They don't exist. Yeah, Um, we don't see all that stuff they had back in the 90s. Even though this show was clearly, like, uh, trying to get Game of Thrones style going. Yeah. And I think every way. <laughs> uh, also, I mean, I guess the 90s are long enough now that people can start calling them classic. Yeah, you can. But uh, I don't know if you call them classical. Cl- yeah, classical implies like like generations ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you can call something a classic, like, that's fine, but classical implies that, like, we're listen- we're, like, listening to Beethoven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so this person was very enthusiastic about this show, so, I don't know, if you're like this person, if you related to this review, maybe you love this show. Um, I'll get my thoughts on it later on. Yeah. Uh, I do have the Rotten Tomatoes up here for Shadow and Bone, and I found some... So, uh, Rotten Tomatoes was very positive about this show. Yeah, like a, like a big old tomato there. It was an 86% from the critics, so that's a certified they fresh tomato. They loved it. And the audience loved it even more, a 91% from the audience. A bucket of popcorn? Bucket, a full bucket of popcorn. No way. That's a And, s- wow. on the page here, there was only one negative review from the top critics. Okay, what do they have to say? This is from Mark Mazoros of the News Herald. The storytelling in this adaptation from showrunner Eric Hesserer fails to establish and maintain a momentum nearly as powerful as some of the show's magic. Okay. 
It's a magic-based show, so that you got to incorporate some of that in there. Yeah, you got to use a little bit of wordplay if you're a top critic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and now I've got this positive one here. This is from Jennifer Bissett of CNET, which I guess they do entertainment reviews. Isn't that that site where you can download software that has like a bunch of crap bundled on it? <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure. Um, I, I didn't dare click on the full review of this just in case it was. Yeah. Uh, it's strange. You almost want Alina to take a back step and let the darker side characters shine. Yet, it's thanks to their wild card additions that Shadow and Bone stands apart from the packed ranks of young adult viewing. Interesting. Something so, to think about. Thoughts packed, later packed on. Packed ranks out there, Kyorain, of young adult viewing. Also, is that what this show's going for? Is like Game of Thrones, but it's for young adults? I I guess. That sounds like a poor idea. It's like Game of Thrones, but like they don't have any sex and they don't talk about sex. Yeah, that's no good. It's like Game of Thrones, but like at the beginning when like the lady wants to have sex, the guy's like, no. Yeah. I have to go. Here's Literally. the thing about young adults, Kyorain, is they love sex. What? Yeah, why don't we just put it in there? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're because that's what they're doing. No, Swanson, come on. The young adults yeah. don't think about stuff like that. You're right, they're very chaste individuals. <laughs> they sit down, no. they pray, and they eat vitamins. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And they say uh, and they apologize for, that's for right. sinning. Yes, they well yeah, they, they sit down, they pray, and also apologize for sinning as they're praying, and then they eat vitamins. <laughs> <laughs> Too many vitamins, some might say. Yeah, they're they're all swole. <laughs> um, all right, do we want to talk about Jupiter's Legacy? Yeah. Um, so I didn't watch that, so I've only got one IMDb review for that. That's fine. And it's a long one, so you know, it was this is one of the top rated ones too. Like a lot of people saw this, and a lot of people found it helpful. So on. All right, it's a seven out of ten, and it's titled. Have some patience. This isn't TikTok. <laughs> okay. This is by Andrew Backy Bakarich. I don't know. Uh, Mark Miller originally wanted this to be a movie, but was advised by James Gunn to turn it into a 40-hour series because of the extensive backstory and setup that would need to go into it. If we were to get this as a movie, we'd have a Watchmen situation on our hands where everything about the characters is set up in the three minutes we had before the opening credits. I would urge people to give it a chance and wait and see what happens. Yes, this season it's setting things up, but considering the alternative, I'd rather get it this way. In a market that is completely saturated by superhero movies, it's refreshing to see something with a little more depth and world building than others we've seen. Give it a chance and disregard the 10 star and 1 star reviews. It's not that black and white, folks. 379 okay, so can... out of 479 uh, oh. found this helpful. All right, pretty good ratio. Um, probably one of the best from a review we picked. Uh, okay, so I should focus on the two-star reviews and the nine-star reviews then. Seven-star reviews are the sweet spots once in like this, like this one. Yeah. Um, all right, so right off the bat, they're talking about the first three minutes of Watchmen, which... Uh, is widely regarded as one of the best openings of the uh, was was like the best part of the movie for a lot of people is how quickly it's able to convey a world to you in like three minutes of time. It's almost like it's a good thing to be able to set up your movie really fast and effectively without confusing the audience. Yeah, instead of taking a whole season apparently to world build. Yeah, I like how this review doesn't even talk about the quality of the show at all. It just says like. Better than uh, not be, not getting it set up for you. Like the terrible Watchmen movie, which nobody liked. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. Interesting choice there. Interesting shoes. Yeah, I never saw Watchmen. Uh, that's, that's a good movie, right? Uh, I would say it's, it's easily the best movie Zack Snyder ever made. Okay, that's not a good, that's not a good thing. I mean, it's a good movie. I like it. It's not like, listen, the graphic novel is like, 
impossible to beat in terms of like you can't really adapt it and make it better. Okay, it's kind of yeah. like the best of its genre for its re- for a reason. It's definitely not the movie you would say like avoid this at all costs. Never do anything like this. No, it's about the best adaptation that you could probably get of the movie of a movie version of Watchmen. Okay. Yeah. Um so yeah. All right. So I've got some uh some I it's not IMDb. I've got some Rotten Tomatoes reviews. Oh, from the real people. Yeah, the critics. Um now they call the, they don't call this season 1 because it's a comic book mo- uh, TV show. They call it volume 1. Oh, how fancy. Uh, it's got a 38% from the critics. Oh, is that a green splat, Swanson? That's a huge stinker green splat there. Okay, but the audience, the 73% liked it, so that's a bucket of popcorn. Wow. You could just grab a whole handful of that, couldn't you? Yeah. Could crunch it up, munch it up, do whatever you want to it. All right, so what, uh, what are they saying about it? Why are they... Why are they all stinker on this one? Uh, well, to do that, we have to go to our critics reviews, obviously. Uh, and this one that comes from Glenn Weldon of NPR. The ultimate effect is a lot like watching the 2009 film Julie and Julia. In that sense, or in that sense, if you imagine that Julia Child could fly and shoot lasers out of her eye holes, that is. Oh, that went over my head. Uh, Julia Child's a cook, but also uh, I just thought it was a very weird blurb to include. Yeah, I, I was was who, who did somebody actually pick that? Apparently, that was the I don't know whoever's in charge of making blurbs at Rotten Tomatoes decided that was one. Bizarre. Um, I have a shorter negative one that's probably more accurate to our feelings on uh, Jupiter's Legacy. Uh, this is from Randy Jones at Randy Reviews. Uh, love the alliteration, Randy. Oh, to be that sad soul that they abused their adult superhero series right after Invincible. Ooh. Yeah, sick burn. Uh, that's that's a that's a spicy one. Yeah. Oh, did you finish uh, Invincible, by the way? No, uh, I'm st- I still haven't watched uh, any of it past the first episode. I plan on watching it. Oh yeah, eventually. I watched it. It's good. Yeah, I'll get I'll get to the you know I'm on, I'm kind of on the Gundam train right now. Yeah, uh, it's a good train to be on. Don't worry. I've got a positive review here too. There are a couple. Uh, this one is from Emma <laughs> Stefanski of Thrillist. Okay. The show doesn't have the manic, meany flow that makes Amazon Prime's The Boys such an engaging watch, or of the bracing absurdity of HBO Max's Doom Patrol, but it pays respects to its origins while trying to figure out what it wants to be next. Trying to figure so out. I, not not the most glowing review, is it? No, there's not, not the most positive of a review. It's not like this show or this other show, but it is it's, it is a show. It is trying to figure out what it wants to do. <laughs> yeah, that's not the most glowing endorsement from uh, from if I if I read that review, I don't think I would even say it was a positive one <laughs> based it's just on this blurb. I think. Yeah, definitely not. It sounds like uh, faint the faintest of praise. So yeah, our thoughts will be coming a little bit later on in the show on, on yes. the two shows we just discussed. Yeah, we're gonna. It's a two for one special this week on TV Tuners, so you can look forward to those uh, later on in the pod. But for now, let's get to the news, huh, Keo? Yes. All right, we have some stuff to. We have some news items here uh, that are of interest. Uh, Keo Rang, what's your favorite award show? Um, award. Do I like any award shows? Oh, that was the correct answer. No, the answer is no awards because they all suck. Uh, but perhaps the suckiest of award shows is the Golden Globes. Uh, the second best Oscars uh, has been around for a long, a long time now, but uh, recently has taken some fire uh, due to its lack of diversity in its uh, voting body. Yeah, they fix it. Uh, not quite. The Hollywood Foreign Press. Uh, I think we've discussed it on the pod before, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, it's a very it, it's sort of like a scam, 
<laughs> the best no. way to put it. Uh, it has only 80 members compared to like, which is very small. Um, and it's like a lot of them are just people who don't even really do, aren't really entertainment journalists. They just sort of hang out and like get the free passes to go around the world and see movies. That sounds like the kind of job we should get. Yeah. Hey, I mean, hey, listen, maybe we should cut this one short and just hope that they uh, put us in their new diversity reforms. Yeah, we're diverse. Yeah. One of us. Yeah, we're we're diverse. One of us is Italian. Yeah, you. Yeah. And the other one's Irish. You. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the apparently the most recent uh, Golden Globes came under fire because it was revealed that the HFPA does not have a single member of color on their uh, really on their r- roster. That's insane. Yeah. Um, and uh, after a bunch of uh, popular celebrities such as Tom Cruise, Mark Ruffalo, so and so all came out against the Golden Globes. NBC announced that the Golden Globes will not air in 2022. Uh, they have they they're in the home of the Golden Globes for a while now, uh, and have instead positioned the show to air in January of 2023 when it's re- when it's reformed itself. That's interesting. So are they going to fix it? They're going to add like a, a black guy who gets yeah, high, who gets three three fifths of a vote. Uh, according to the um, HFPA, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, they're going to the, the address their lack of black members and do better uh, than it's proposed. Uh, it originally proposed an 18-month timeline to add 50% more black members, which I guess is uh, 50% zero. of zero. <laughs> um, and yeah, they're going to, I guess they're going to speed up that timeline now to sort of make sure everything's better so that they can, uh, you know, not be the laughing stock of, less of a laughing stock, I guess. I think they're trying to be better than the Grammys. Because, you know, the old Simpsons joke is that the Grammys are the worst. Why would they say this? What, I, what do you, you're a big Grammys fan, k uh, I think they're all like bad, right? Yeah, all re- all award shows suck. Uh, the it's not like necessary to care about them. We like we only talk about it because it's tangentially related to TV. But like True. they're all they're all just like self congratulatory things that air on TV only because they're part of the entertainment business, and they used to attract audiences, and now they don't anymore because. A lot of people are like us and don't care. Yeah, because we keep seeing shows that are really good or whatever just, like, get snubbed. And it's, we see it's clearly, like, a political thing and not actually prestigious. And we're not actually going to see the best things from it. Yeah. Very true. Uh, I mean, yeah, because the last season of Game of Thrones won awards. So, like, how does that make any sense? It doesn't. Um... So yeah, we'll we'll see what the Golden Globes reforms into, but I bet you it'll still suck. That's my uh, positive outlook. Well, I can't believe you just said that. Yeah. Speaking of people who still suck, let's talk about Ellen DeGeneres. Oh, so Ellen is that like lady who's who has like an authentic talk show, right? Yeah, she has like a talk show that's like people dance on the show. And, like, everyone's, like, real happy. But behind the <laughs> scenes, apparently, everybody's real unhappy. Because the show is, like, poorly run. And also, she's allegedly very mean. That's sad. Yeah. It's like, uh... uh well, it's yeah, nice. you might have heard, Kioran, that all of these uh, allegations have come out recently about the poor workplace environment of Ellen. Uh, although Ellen herself has been able to sort of not be in the crosshairs by claiming that she wasn't aware of the backstage environment of her show, which is a very odd thing to, that we just let slide, I guess. Yeah. That the person who the show is named after wasn't aware of what the show was like. She just completely detached from it. <laughs> yeah. So either. So the best case scenario means that she doesn't even run her own show. 
that has her name. She just sort of sits in her trailer and waits for the show to happen. I mean, I would believe it. Yeah, I guess that's true. That's probably how most shows work, right? Like the like the um, like you know like uh, Stephen Colbert probably doesn't like get intimately involved in his show. Yeah, probably not. Like, I don't know. It it's like so. Those are those, they're so hollow, right? Yeah, especially like the daytime ones. The late night ones are also equally hollow in their own way, but sometimes they'll have something worthwhile. The host has to actually care, basically. Yes, exactly. Um, but also, we're so far away from the moment when those shows mattered. Like, the the it's been like, what, like, ten... When was the last time you even heard of something big happening on a late show? When Trump was running for president? Uh, I, I guess. I don't know. Like, when he showed up on Jimmy Fallon and Jimmy Fallon tousled his hair? I didn't hear about that, so I guess it wasn't even important. Oh, yeah, that was like a big damning moment for Jimmy Fallon. He <laughs> he got in trouble. I mean, he, I don't know if he, I don't think he himself got in any trouble with like NBC because they were probably all too happy to have Donald Trump on their show. But uh, it, it's just been like a thing where everybody was like, "Oh yeah, that makes sense that Jimmy Fallon would just like not care about this guy actually being a jerk." Which is not even, it's not even that fair, because Stephen Colbert also had Donald Trump on in that same year. They were, it's part of the whole thing, is just playing it up like it wasn't a big deal. Because no yeah, one believed Jimmy, that he had a chance. You think Jimmy Fallon's human? Uh, hmm. I think he might be an algorithm. Yeah, like, they just downloaded it, like a, like a AI into, is he like a robot, or like, he's just... CGI on the screen. I think I think he was the first CGI creation because he was in on SNL in like the early two th- thousands, so he had to have been pretty early CGI. But also, it was like it was like cutting edge stuff, like the stuff we see now was be- possible because of Jimmy Fallon's work. That's crazy. So, uh, I'm saying though, is like he he's not a real person at all. He's just like edited. No, he's a construct. Video. His so sole purpose is to be mildly entertaining. I'm saying, though, could people actually interact with him in the physical world, or was he edited into the show like uh, after the fact? Uh, no, you can see him if you go like watch the studio, live studio show, but you don't see him walking around on the street or anything. Like He says he has a wife and kids. They don't exist. Okay, yeah. I, I, I believe that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, or maybe they do actually exist, but like they they just play up the game for like like his kids <laughs> are like not like his kids are not his really. There's like yeah. all actors. Yeah, they're not adopted. They're just actors. <laughs> That's right. Um. Anyway, yeah, Ellen DeGeneres has recently announced that she is ending her show uh, after the next season. Yeah. Well, does she say what she's going to do next? No. Uh, she does have she does have a very uh, interesting statement, which says that uh, does she finds she no longer finds the show challenging anymore. Challenging, okay. Mm, which sounds like uh, what you say when you have a bunch of employees who allege that there was fear and intimidation going on behind the scenes. Uh, yeah, but how, perhaps how, more how importantly, sh- how yeah. the sh- what does that mean? The show's not challenging. What is that even supposed to mean? Like it got it, too it, easy. Does anyone think does anyone think Ellen was ever challenging? Like did anyone watch the show and get like really like think it was like a real challenge to make it make it? I don't know. And if it's not challenging, then why don't you just up the ante, right? Yeah, make make it more challenging. Why don't you like put put on a war criminal? Interview them. S- see if you can get America to love them. Don't don't do this. Uh it'll just work. get get Osama bin Laden Back. on the show. Yes. See how it announce goes. that you have a year long plan that you're going to revive Osama bin Laden. Uh, but also another per- potential reason, and probably the actual reason, is that uh, ever since the expose went viral, uh, Ellen lost over a million viewers. 
Oh, so, so it's not challenging because he's not making as, a, as much money out of it. That's what that yeah, means. Yeah, it's not challenging because, uh, you know, contracts will be different now because she has less viewers. Uh, so, yeah, good, good. The best of uh, the best of luck to Alan on her future endeavors, which I imagine are just sitting on top of a giant pile of money, or running for president. Who knows? Oh God, why would you even say that, Gioré? Now it's going to happen. <laughs> I can't will things like that into existence, Swanson. I don't have that power yet. We're going to have the Rock Ellen twenty twenty four. That soon? Yeah. Oh, Listen, the Rock's no. not getting any younger. True. Oh, man. And people will be, like, excited because it'll be America's first gay vice president. Oh, my God. You th- Yeah, you thought Mayor Pete was bad, Keo Rain. Mayor Pete's definitely not human, by the way. Oh, no, that's a, that, that was the first. He was probably inspired by the CGI Jimmy Fallon. Yeah, he's like, wow, can I be that inauthentic? And it turns <laughs> out, yes, he's the Jimmy Fallon of politics. That's crazy. Uh, speaking of former figures of uh, adoration who have slowly given away their goodwill, let's talk about Dan Harmon. Okay, let's talk about him for like, I don't know, I'll give you one minute to talk about this guy. Okay, uh, the creator of Community and of course uh, co-creator of Rick and Morty, Dan Harmon is a guy that we all know and tolerate, I guess, at this point. Uh, he, he's, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a fine he's a fine individual, I suppose. Uh, yeah. If you ignore all the times where he seems very um, self-assured of himself and his ego. Yeah, I'm, I'll happily ignore that for one minute. Uh, Dan Harmon has a new Fox animated series called Kropopolis, which is going to be about... Uh, it's going to be some mashup of like Greece, ancient Greece and modern culture and politics. So it sounds awful. Um and Fox has announced that it's going. Uh, Fox, the show that he's producing it with, is going announced that it's going to be uh, strap in for this one. The first ever animated series, quote unquote, curated entirely on the blockchain. What? That's right. Fox and animation studio Bento Box are going to Time's establish up. a. Okay, we're dedicated- done talking about this. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard, Swanson. We're done <laughs> talking about it. We're oh, moving Pekeo, on. That's, there's so much. Was- there's so much stupider. All right, I'll give you 30 more seconds. Uh, Fox and Bento Box are going to establish a dedicated digital marketplace to sell goods related to the shows, ranging from NFTs to one-of-a-kind character background art and gifts. Oh, my God, stop. Who, why would... Do not support this, everybody. Just if, if you see NFT or anything like that on a product, just say no. Say no to yeah. NFTs, folks. It's the stupidest thing there could possibly be. You don't even own the thing. Yeah, and now Swanson Time is officially up. We are, that's gone. Like, no, no, no. Can I say one more thing? One more thing. They, refi- they they say that this is a great experience for Kropopolis super fans. This show's not even on the air yet. Who are the super fans for this? They're going to get them. They, they're they very confident in that, Swanson. Like, they're is Elon Musk funding this? Well, not apparently not, because he doesn't like NFTs anymore, but. Oh, he, he he figured out they were stupid. He decided that he didn't like them anymore. Uh, yeah, after he bought out a bunch of money in Bitcoin and then sold it back, he stopped making it a thing uh, that you could pay t- for with Teslas. Like his te- like the, how, the the company Tesla does not accept Bitcoin anymore. How do you not have to figure it out and then figure it out? I don't I don't I don't know how that happens. Listen, like how do you a lot not know that Bitcoin is terrible and then learn that Bitcoin is terrible when you're like a billionaire? <laughs> well, you just don't care, right? That's the thing. Is like you're like, how can I make money off of this situation? How do you start caring though? Well, you, like, uh, what well is that's the, a secret, Kyo, and he never cared. Well, why did the the strategy changed. They realized it wasn't going to make money. Like the they were like, no, guys. no. I'm saying I'm I'm telling you why he switched up. He made money off of Bitcoin. He waited for he the price went up after he started talking about it, and then he sold it for more money. His Bitcoin. How much did he? How much did he put in it? I guess that makes sense. It could have kept going up though. Yeah, maybe. But he, I guess, he decided that that was the point where he was good. So he sold it, and now he's he badmouthed it on SNL apparently. 
and then set it, banned it from being used uh, on Tesla products. Yeah, you, you know what Bitcoin is, right? It's it's definitely at least when used this way is a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> yep, that's I mean that's yeah, pretty much. Um, anyway, we'll we'll have to wait and see how this Kropopolis thing steps out, but already it sounds exhausting. Oh, uh, I can't imagine it being good. No, I don't like. Uh, I don't want stop. Don't we, don't. Like, why do we have to figure out what like we were? We already have a perfectly fine way of destroying the environment. Why do we have to come up with more worse ways of doing it? Yeah, even if you you can develop a blockchain that doesn't require a lot of energy, why would you use it for a TV show? Well, what is the utility we're getting out of it? Like what? Tell me, Swanson. Uh, you can buy like a GIF of like an Egyptian guy going like "suck it." Yeah, I I could get that free. I guess it's a Greek guy. My bad. Anyway, yeah, Kropopolis it, as a show is doesn't even have art. <laughs> yeah, just the just the name. It's just the I mean, name like, and a concept. Like it's so the, it's so recently in development that there's not even concept art for it yet. He probably has a couple doodles of it that he hasn't released yet. He's gonna put them on. Oh, he's gonna sell them on for as NFTs. I bet. Watch. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Anyway, this sucks. Um, you know, I I used to think that maybe people were being a little overzealous on Rick and Morty fans, and they probably still are. But uh, maybe they're maybe they weren't wrong about the creators. Yeah. Maybe not. Um. Anyway. That's it for the news, Kieran. So let's head over to a segment uh, near and dear to our hearts. It's time for Trailer Blazers. Hit the theme. Yeah, uh, this week we're talking about a Peacock original series. <laughs> peacock. Based on a peacock. Based on a true story. It's called Dr. Death. Uh, and yeah, th- that's what's going on here. Death. This guy, people are dying. Yeah, it's, it's about out why. a real world doctor who did a really bad job on a lot of patients before getting uh, his license revoked and then going to jail. Yeah. It looks like the show could be mildly interesting. It has a pretty good cast. You got Alec Baldwin here being like, we got to stop this doctor. They do have this to stop man, him. This man's a sociopath. What a nasty man. Yeah, you're a na- you're a nasty little pig. That's what he says to the guy. <laughs> yeah, it, it's definitely one of those. Uh, what do you call it? Stranger than fiction stories. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think the thing that's keeping me from being at, at least moderately interested in this as a program is that the person that they have chosen to play this guy does not seem very compelling. Yeah, he's just like, oh, I did the thing wrong. I'm gonna shake my hands a little bit. Yeah, he's like, oh yeah, I'm a, a I'm a, a, I'm a deaf dealer. Turns out, whoopsie. Like he's so, like, he's like, I don't make mistakes. Yeah, this is based off of a man named uh, Christopher uh, Dunsch. Dunsch. I don't know how you say his last name. Um, but he is. Uh, he was a neurosurgeon who. And he's let in his uh, around two years of medical service in Texas, injured and maimed 33 out of 38 of his patients. Wow. Including killing two of them. How do you manage it? Uh, apparently, he just did a lot of drugs and was in crippling debt when he decided to get into neurosurgery, a field he was not interested in. And yeah, they don't allude to this at all in the trailer. No, like, I feel like. Also, according to the uh, some stuff I've read, he was like very boisterous about his abilities, even when he was just starting out. So, like, but we don't see any of that in this. I guess we, maybe we they, see him say, yeah. we see him say there's like there's no complications when he does surgery. He did say that, I guess. Yeah, I guess that's true. I, I just like play it up for me a little bit, you know. Like yeah, the, sh- uh, apparently, show me this character a little bit more than than him being like in the um, surgery room, getting looking frustrated for two seconds. Yeah, like a, a, apparently a veteran, like uh, vascular surgeon who worked with him, said that he could not even wield a scalpel. 
Like, how do you, like, what? (laughs) How do you not just stop him right there? Yeah, like, what do you, like... Do you just watch him? Like, (laughs) if you, uh, like, I don't know how this person was managed for two years. I guess that's the story, you know? It feels, but, um, I'm, I'm, I'm already fearing that we're going to get like a, the serpent situation where the main, the real person is way more interesting than what they give us for the story. Yeah. Um, it's, it seems like it might go that way, which, uh, is unfortunate because it's actually a really interesting story. That's like, it's definitely one of the craziest things I've ever heard of. Yeah. And it's like, doctor who like maimed 30 people and still worked all those years. That's, that's wild. And you can definitely relate it to modern issues of like uh, medical malpractice and just the health care system in general. True. So like, yeah, it's it's definitely there's something there. Could be fun. I would, you know, I'd get I'd give the first episode a try. Yeah, I definitely would, would uh, give this a shot on TV Tuners podcast. Yeah. So you know, maybe it's a stay tuned. Unless there's like an anime with like uh, a lot of attractive women being p- uh, pitted against it, then I pick the the anime program. So be careful with that one. All right. Well, I'll uh, I'll remember that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I it's a I think it was like a tune in in the future, probably. Yeah, like I would a, agree. You know, a, a future tune in if like the if the stars align. Also, the trailer was two minutes, 30 seconds long. You could have got the whole thing across in 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, we listen. Just like how I'm a fan of under two hour long movies. Make make trailers under two minutes. Yeah, don't even make for, it that long. Like a minute and a half is my, my limit there, honestly. Yeah, take the average length of the, uh, the what the movie version of your TV show would be and then make that the minute plus version if your if your tv show would be a 90 minute movie make me a uh minute long trailer yeah do it yeah i guess by marketing standards this must be working right probably um well also now because of uh People scrolling on social media, they have to have the tra- the little trailer before the trailer. Where it's That's like, annoying. Dr. Death, he's coming. He's walk. He's walking towards you. Yeah, and then you have to like, and then if you sit there, then the, and then the actual trailer plays. Um. So yeah, that, we'll see where that goes. Uh, but with all of that out of the way, Keo, I think we can wait no longer. It's time for us to discuss what we watched this week. Uh, we watched two shows, of course, but the main one, the one that we were supposed to both watch and didn't happen, was Jupiter's Legacy. Uh, what? Jupiter's Legacy follows Sheldon Sampson, a, uh, a regular man in the 1920, in 1929 who travels to an uncharted island and gains powers along with his brother and four others. Uh, in the modern day, uh, his family has become the next generation of superheroes who struggle to live up to his rigid ideals and high expectations. Uh, Kioran, did Jupiter's legacy, uh, make you soar in the sky or did it leave you, uh, weak and powerless? Uh, well, I didn't watch the show, but I did watch part of it, like you said, and I, look, I got some enjoyment out of it. I thought it was funny. Yeah, do you think do you think funny was what they were going for? I hope it was, but I doubt it. Yeah, uh, I did watch all of it, and I can say I think almost confidently that funny was not uh, what they were going for. From the the the, I think they were trying for some light comedy in some bits, but the jokes were not the funny parts for me. Um. Like the Iron Lady shows up or whatever, and she's like, "This is my plan now, bitches." And I'm Robin. Like, I'm Robin this bitch right now. Yeah, it was like, uh, okay. <laughs> the The writing is laughably bad on this show. Um, like that's the that's their idea of a retort is someone says, "Hey, lady, we're robbing this bitch," and then she says, "No, I'm robbing this bitch." 
Yeah, I, I thought that was hilarious. And like, like she suits up and she's like purple Iron Man. It's like yeah, amazing. Iron, she's Iron Lass. Yeah, it's like Iron. It's like Iron Lass, and it's got like a a tenth or less of the Iron Man budget. Yeah. Um, and also we uh, she does beat up a, another superhero. Uh, I guess the Super Boy equivalent. Um, and we don't see that. We just see him fly into a building. Because, you know, you can't blow your entire effects budget by having a superhero fight in your superhero show. Yes. Um, but, you know, l- listen, there's a lot that I could say about Jupiter's legacy. But um, why don't we why don't we s- switch gears a little bit here? Let's focus on Shadow and Bone first. Okay. Um, see, I watched that in, in its entirety. And I was actually shocked to see the Rotten Tomatoes was like so ridiculously high because uh, maybe it's like uh, because they watched the whole se- season or whatever. But the first episode, oh boy. So, so you watched the first five minutes. Why don't you describe that? And then I'll, I'll keep going. Uh, it does a thing that I, well, we've talked about it many times on the pod. It does a thing that I don't like, which is shifting at random between timelines, especially in the in the first five minutes. You're going to switch timelines? And what do they show us in that first timeline? Uh, The first one? Well, they show yeah. this lady I mean, doing doodles. Yeah. And are you talking about when she's a kid? Yeah, sorry, the kid timeline. The first yeah, chronological timeline. She's doing doodles, and uh, this other kid comes in and is like, Hey, I'm a friend. And then this bully comes in, and he's like, I'm a bully. And then she draws a knife on him, and then... That's it. We get some exposition a, too. Well, yeah, there's a lot of exposition up front on this one, which, uh, okay, sure. I, I, I almost was gonna let it. I was gonna let it pass because you know, why not just get it done up in front? I guess. But um, I don't know. It's weird because like I wasn't interested at all. But like, there's at least some sort of like potential. It seems like in that concept that they lay out in the f- first five minutes. It's just that they do something I don't like right off the bat, which is they have to show me her child backstory, even though I didn't need it right then and there. And it didn't tell us anything interesting or show us anything exciting. It was just like, oh, she was a kid and there was a little bit of drama, I guess. Yeah, it would be the equivalent of like, you get you get to the opening and Breaking Bad and Walter White is like driving the RV and the pants are flying off the RV or whatever. <laughs> and uh, then it cuts and it's like him as a kid and his like his mom, his like dad came, didn't come to his baseball game. <laughs> and you're like, oh, yeah, and, all right, why and, is and, this and, in there? And, and his mom's there and they hug. And she tells him it's all right, sweetie. And then it cuts back to the, the present. Yeah, but also in the present, the there's like, uh, like he's like sitting there driving his RV, and he's like, in 2008, the healthcare system is ravaged. <laughs> A lonely teacher like me working another job couldn't afford health treatments for their cancer. I've had to resort to drastic measures to make my money. I had money. to break bad. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and the, and the intro was a whole minute long. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, and I mean, there is a skip intro button there taunting you, but you're not going to skip intro on the on the on the first episode. No, of course not. Yeah. So um, yeah, there's some exposition about her parents died because they tried to go through some. I forgot what it was called already. I watched the whole thing. I don't remember what it was called. I should know this. You talking my, about this the is fold? My fault. The fold. Yeah. Yeah, this is like a land of darkness or whatever. It's a land of darkness. It's like uh, this epically dangerous location that you shouldn't go into, but people have to because uh, it's geographically re- relevant because there's hostile nations to the north and south, which they explain to us. They don't show it to us, of course. Why would they do that? No. They, uh, uh, well, that's how that's what made Game of Thrones so popular, Kyoran, is they uh, just had the characters say all this stuff to each other. <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah, that's the, that's the deal. Basically, it's a place that people really want to get across because it's really convenient. It's like a really nice spot to get through. But, you know, too bad it's like you're going to die if you go through it, apparently. Yeah, that's a shame. Real bummer how that works out. 
So yeah, it, it's it's established as pretty much certain death if you try to go through there. People went through there anyway, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that we talk about the two time the uh, d- jumping around timelines thing because uh, Jupiter's legacy also does that. Yeah. Um, in a weirder way, I would I would even argue. I don't know. Yeah. Um. So Jupiter's legacy is. Uh, it jumps between the present and then to like I think it even does a flash forward at one point, but I might yeah, be wrong. What is up with writers? I'm thinking like doing nonlinear time is like gonna make their show better or something. I think they just think it's a great way to pad out the runtime of something. Maybe it has to be the way they do it, right? Because like so many shows we've been watching this year. And it feels like even more this year than even like the last couple of years that we've been doing the pod. It's they've it's been like an increase in shows that are just always going to the well of just multiple timelines. You don't always have to split things up into the past and the present. Yeah, I don't know. Um, although it's not it's not always a bad thing to do. Sometimes it can work if, if it has a reason, right? Well, yeah, that's the thing. You like. You have to make it not kill the flow of your show. You have to make it so that, like, usually a flashback is supposed to inform something that we are about to see in the character. Yeah. Like, uh, a good example is, um, I don't remember what episode. I think it was uh, early in season three. But the episode, there's an episode where... It shows Jimmy McGill and Better Call Saul, and he's running his parents' shop, and he's like taking money from the till or whatever. Um, and it's isn't a whole like, episode. Ch- yeah, and like it's like the opening to the episode, and it establishes for us why Chuck doesn't like that, like doesn't distrust his brother. Like and it, it gives it us exa- the whole the whole story too. Yeah. Also, it's important to know it comes after years of development of why we already we know already the relationship between them. Yeah, so it's a really good use of a, of a flashback. Flashbacks. I think I feel like flashbacks don't work as well when you're explaining something that hasn't already been established. Like yeah, I feel like especially it doesn't work as well when it doesn't explain anything except for giving a little bit of exposition that we could have gotten in present time. Right. Well, th- that's the most egregious part, right? Um in this one they use the flashbacks to explain how they got powers. Um except they don't even do that in this episode. It's apparently a season long flashback. Um so the whole like season is I guess them explaining how uh, the Utopian, which is the main Superman archetype in Jupiter's Legacy, got his powers. But in this need, episode... Do we need that at all for our, our superhero stories on this No, point? that's actually something, oddly enough, that you could explain in exposition. You know, very quickly, too. Yeah. Very quickly. Um, unless it's like... Unless it's, for some reason, the most relevant thing to the series... Then go like ahead, they had but to it do seems something like, really dramatic to get the power or something. Uh, I mean, do you want me to? According to Wikipedia, they went to a mysterious island and got powers. That's not what I mean by dramatic. I mean, like they did something moral, right? I I mean, maybe it's just because I'm going off of just basic descriptions. So I'm I don't saying, know like, what if, happens if, there. If the character got their power by like eating the heart of somebody else with the power or something, that would be maybe something you could do with a flashback, and right. not exposition, right? <laughs> like maybe, maybe I'm wrong here, and the flashbacks are like he has to follow this code in order to keep his me- his powers or something. That would be interesting. It's probably not it, but that would be interesting. Uh, I mean, maybe he is really rude about it at the end of the episode, which we'll we'll get to. Yeah. Um, but no, instead, uh, what we get in this flashback is him and his brother are working for their dad at a wall, like, in a Wall Street company. I thought you were going to say Walgreens. Yeah, they're working for Walgreens. Uh, and can you guess what year it is that they're working in Keoran? Because, you know, they're on Wall Street, and, oh, they're really old. 
That's, oh, is it right before the uh, big uh, financial collapse? Uh, that's right, buddy. Yeah, they're definitely gonna go to that <laughs> that well. Um, and there's a perhaps. Um, right off the bat, I want to say that these this show we we discussed it in the tweet of the week a little bit, but this show has some of the worst superhero costumes I've seen. Uh, like these, it looks like they're doing like, this is like sub CW level. Like in terms of character design and stuff, like the utopian, the main character has like this really bad gray wig for most of the episode. Yeah. Um, They need to figure out that like when you're doing these costumes, you have to, you have to put a little more effort into them than if you're drawing a cartoon. (laughs) Yeah, uh, it's just, uh, it looks like they were just trying to be as faithful as possible to the comic book and didn't think at all about how it would look in real life. Yeah, uh, when you have a stylized cartoon, uh, you can get away with a lot. Yeah. Very, very simple design that look good because you're not expecting to see detailed realism. <laughs> There's a reason that Homelander looks different on The Boys, the show, than he did in the comic book, The Boys. It's because it just looks better on TV the way he does there than he does in the comic book. Yeah. Um, And it's just, yeah, you just have to adapt things to make sense for, like, there's a reason that in the Avengers movies, Hawkeye is not wearing a purple uh, suit that he wears in the comic books because it wouldn't really work as well. Yeah, it it would look actually silly rather than just moderately silly like it does in the comic books right um but ignoring that uh this show also does perhaps the laziest suicide i've ever seen um not in the person's part the person i guess is going all in on the suicide uh but it's just the laziest way of setting it up so the uh the wall street crash happens their father's business like collapses uh Sheldon uh the main character the main superman archetype the utopian goes to see his dad on the top of the roof and uh he's like hey listen dad you know it's not that bad and he's like uh hey son tell them uh he's like you're right son uh tell them I'm ma- on my way down and then he just jumps off the roof wow complete with uh dad no Well, you would say that, Swanson. That's what you would say if you, <laughs> if you saw that. Yeah, I would just, like, scream, Dad, no, as he's already... He, like, he can't take it back now. Uh, I mean, maybe you could take it back. Maybe he had powers. Might as well try. I guess it's true. Uh, no, well, no, he hadn't gone to the island yet. Well, how does how do we know that? I guess it's true. We don't know what happened. Um... The show also does a thing that's very annoying for me, uh, which is that it introduces, uh, when it cuts between the present and the past, it'll do something like a guy shows up and he's talking with, uh, the brothers and, uh, he's like, Hey, it's me. Hey. And they're like, Oh, Hey, our pal Gordon, what's up Gordon. And then it'll cut into the present and they'll have, they'll be having their scene there. And then offhandedly, one of the brothers will be like, it's a shame Gordon betrayed us. <laughs> it's like why why say that right now why like why ruin that you mean get, getting rid of any possible dramatic tension just like completely undercutting what could be good A big flashback reveal. and flash and like present like cutting and in, intercutting like okay, so we're we were talking about it earlier. I think another way that you can do past and present stuff is if you line them up in ways that like it dramatically it's dramatically satisfying. Like mm-hmm. you can com- you can have the a, a story set in the past that shows you moments in the future, right? Like you, let's say, okay, so let's say this Gordon character. I don't think that's his name. I think his name's like George or something. But he becomes a superhero, apparently. Uh, Named Gordon. <laughs> yeah, it's, he becomes a superhero, I think, whose name is Sky Fox. I don't know what his powers are. Maybe flying. No, I'm thinking, like, his his name is George, but the superhero name is Gordon. 
<laughs> I'm Gordon. Super secret <laughs> hero, secret name George, alias George. <laughs> um, but like you can do a thing where uh, later down the line, after you've established the relationship between George and these brothers, you can do a thing where it cuts to the present and you see that George is like imprisoned because he did something. That's that could be something instead of this. Where they just mention offhand, yeah, he betrayed us and he's in jail. Yeah, um, that that's called exposition. <laughs> yeah, it's called bad, it's called bad exposition. The worst kind of exposition, like where you could have sh- like very effectively shown it, but just chose not to because I don't know, it was too hard. Yeah, it would, you had so much that you had to do. I guess that's very important. Um, so let's talk about the, this ending scene here, Q, right? Or yeah, let's go back to Shadow and Bone, I guess. Let's, let's get your, what you, what you got to tell me about that. Because I've been talking okay, about this so for a while. It's been a little bit of time, I don't know, jumping around between characters, like a lot, just a lot of different characters going around doing their own thing. There's this guy, I think his name is Mal. I don't know what his name is, but he's like, a, a, like a sinister type character who, who's a business guy. And he has, he has like a very sour expression on his face. I think he has a cane, <laughs> but Uh-oh. just a de- like a decorative cane. No good. Um, and yeah, so there's a guy like that, and they're like walking around doing stuff. They're like, we there's like things going on. I wasn't paying attention. I mean, I was paying attention, but I don't remember any of it. Uh, <laughs> and you know, they're like, well, we're in some kind of like military type operation. We're doing s- something. And here's the characters. There's the lady, uh, like her name is Elisa or Alina or something like that. And she's got a best friend character who's there, and they're best friends, and they're like all oh, they're good friends. <laughs> and uh, that's about it for like half of this sh- this runtime. Is they're just like, oh, I'm uh, the, Alina's like, I guess she's she's like basically this world's version of an Asian. Oh, and uh-oh. she's discriminated against. In a very like heavy handed way. Where like they're lining up for their like food and they're like, What are you doing here? You're not you're not like us. Go to the back of the line. We don't like you. And she's like, Oh, okay. That's that's a that's a real stinker right there. She goes to the line and they're like, You get one quarter portion. Yeah. <laughs> and then um and her friend is like, Oh, I'll, I'll grab us some food. So he, he goes and like he goes to grab some grapes from like a, a table sitting out next to some tent. And this lady's like, hey, you can't steal that. You can go in jail for that or be killed or whatever. And he's like, oh, well, are you going to do that? She's like, no, actually, I want to have sex with you. What? And he's like, oh. <laughs> what? Yeah, she's like, yeah, whenever I'm in a, a high-stress situation, I find a random guy, and I have sex with him. And he's like, oh, oh, uh, I have to go. And he leaves. Uh, okay. Well, that's the, that does sound like a show. Um, so, do I keep going and tell you what actually happened? It gets slightly interesting, I guess. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, this is that's the Netflix motto or sort of model is that uh, it's like an Oreo cookie that has none of the cream in it. Yeah. It's just a real they 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 hook you in the opening, and then they make you sit through a bunch of nothing, and then they get they got a little something for you at the end. Oh, well, they didn't even hook us at the beginning of this one. That was the problem. They're just like. I guess it's true. They they give us a concept that's a little interesting with the fold, but I don't care, right? Yeah. Do you care? No. And in the case of Jupiter's Legacy, it's that they uh, they give you a ridiculously horrible opening. We didn't even talk about the like their children playing in a th- playing opening, which was so poorly written and acted. Yeah, they have like a like a schoolyard argument about who like was winning the pretend fight, and like the the little girl reveals like she's like a like a 
child sociopath by unleashing her like screaming powers on the other two children. Thankfully, they're totally unharmed by this, but like you, you don't do that. That's insane. Yeah, and then the uh, what's his uh, what's his face comes down. He's like, we don't do that. Hey, don't do that, children. You're my children. Yeah, I, I was thinking it would have been hardcore if like they were just rendered asunder by this powerful scream attack, but they were just like knocked over a second. They were fine. No, I, I thought that was exactly where it was going, and I was like, oh, this is gonna be like Netflix's The Boys. But no, no they wasn't. don't. They don't do that at all. In fact, the closest thing to gory violence comes at the end, which we'll talk about. Yeah. But what about the what what about the end of Shadow and Bone? Okay, I, yeah. Let me let me get to that. So, um, they they allude to some prophecy where there's something called like a a star bearer or something who's foretold to be able to get rid of the fold, and like, wow, well, I I bet that exists. I'm sure that exists. That's going to be a thing for sure. And it is a thing. See that exist. Sure. It did. Yeah, it does. They reveal it in episode one, of course. Yeah. Well, <laughs> gotta keep gotta keep people interested. They might they might tune out. They're like, oh, I bet it doesn't exist. What's the point? Yeah. So the actual interesting bit of s- story here, I guess, um, comes out of nowhere. We spend half the episode just like bringing in characters who are all unlikable and kind of dour or boring. One of the two dour or boring or both. Oh, great characters. Yeah. I love a girl. I love a character that's dour, but also I love when they're, when they're paired with a character who's boring. Yeah. So they spent a lot of time establishing this, this, this fold as like this place. You, you don't go in there cause you're going to die. You're going to be like a, like a dead boy. If you try to go in there. So don't go in the fold because you're going to die if you go in the fold because the fold is really bad. And so this lady who works for like the she's with like the military, like she she messed up and she lost a bunch of important documents like uh, data about geographic region behind the fold. And like the general guy or whatever is like, you, you, you ruined us. We need that stuff back. You how would you do this? Now we have to send people back through the fold to get more data. And uh, the protagonist volunteers for this suicide mission. Oh, okay. So this is where the Hunger Games part comes in. She volunteers as tribute. She's just like, yeah, I'll do it. And then she, and then he's like, actually, your whole squad's gonna go. And then they're like, oh, okay, I guess we're going. And then they go. And it's fine. It's not fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, they get they get on this boat, this like completely defenseless boat where like the flying monsters can just swoop in and grab people on. And you know they're out on the boat trying to go, and the best friend like gets mortally wounded. And it's like really dramatic. I care about this character so much. Mm, yeah. And uh, you didn't even get to have sex. Th- yeah, I didn't get to have sex. There's no sex at all in this first episode. Probably for the whole thing, because that's what the reviews I read earlier said. <laughs> um, anyhow, though, so she gets grabbed, too. And that really upsets her more than her friend getting grabbed. And she unleashes a, a, a awesome power, which uh, we don't get to see right away. We have to cut to the like these like sinister guys. And they have one of the survivors, they, they've grabbed him, and they're like, you were in the fold, what happened? Like, we heard something crazy went down there. Oh, I didn't even mention, all these guys were trying to make do this job where they're going to get paid to go through the fold for something, like to grab something. They were going to get it paid like a million dollars, but it wasn't dollars, it was some other fantasy currency that sounded vaguely Russian, I think. Yeah, a lot of it seems to be uh, Russian-based. Yeah, so they want the money, so they're, they're like going around like trying to investigate how to get across this place, and th- so they, I don't know how they did it, but they got one of the survivors from this uh, expedition, and he's all like, he's all messed up, he's like, oh, I'm I'm like, oh, we're not doing too great, and they're interrogating, and they're like, what happened down there, and he's like, oh, well, I'll tell you, but you have to let me live, and the, the bad guy's like, oh, yeah, I'll let you live, buddy, now tell me what happened 
And he's like, oh, yeah. So it's apparently the star bearer. And she saw, like, magic, like, light beams. And they show a flashback to that. And he's like, wow. So so the prophecy is real. That's amazing. And he's like, oh, can I go now? Can you let me set me free? And he's like, yeah. And he shoots him in the head. I'm like, oh, I was really shocked by that. Yeah, the oldest trick in the the literal oldest trick in the book. Yeah. It's like it's it's like step 1 in the book. Yeah, it's like here's the first move you learn. Say something and then don't do that. <laughs> yeah, like um anyway, then that's the end. And there and then the guy's like bring me protagonist first name last name. Oh, he already knows her name. Okay. Oh, the guy said his name because like he knew her personally, I guess. Oh, right. Okay. Um, so I mean, bring, I guess that is mildly me. interesting. You're correct on that part, but it does sound like there's a lot of just nothing beforehand. Oh yeah, a, a, a lot of nothing. Um, just people walking around talking to each other about like we live in a world and there's things going on in this world. Isn't that crazy? We're we're doing dialogue exposition here. I feel like it's important to note, because uh, Jupiter's Legacy also did a lot of the just, like, scenes of people talking, which is, I think, what usually occupies a Netflix show in the middle of it. Uh, it's important to note that there are ways to do shows like that and make it interesting. Yeah, for example, you can make them disagreeing with each other. Uh, yeah, and you can make it, like... You make the characters compelling, too, because Jupiter's legacy actually does do the disagreement thing, but all of the characters are just, like, very one note. So, like, the re- the rebel daughter comes to family dinner and starts cussing, and Superman archetype is like, oh, we don't cuss here. Even though we're that's literal gods, we that's believe just, in Jesus. That's just, that's just a, like a dad yelling at his kids. I mean, like, a debate, right? Yeah. Yes, of course. Well, and then the two siblings do have a debate later that means nothing. It's just the two of them talking about the theme, their character themes and arcs. Where she's like, you want to be the next utopian? Well, I don't. It's like, all right, thanks for spelling it out for me. Yeah, or you could have like a um, dialogue where um, two people are lying to each other the whole time. That That could be fun. But yeah. these shows don't do that. They're just like, people are just giving each other information. Well, right. Well, the thing is, like, how often do you go to a family dinner where immediately there's an argument starting? Like, doesn't it brew for a little bit before it boils into an argument? Yeah, definitely. The, you have to build a little bit of tension. That's a fun way to make dialogue interesting as well. Yeah. Um. And there's a scene also with the brothers... Uh, they both have superpowers. It's the, the Superman archetype, and then this his brother Walter is this like mind guy. Um, and they have a scene where they so clearly paint that Walter is like a secret villain that I I'm not even surprised that that's probably like the actual twist. Like, what do they do? So they have this conversation where uh, they get v- extreme, like ex- vaguely political. Where the Utopian is like, this country's more divided than ever. And he's like, there's Nazis roaming the streets. There's people there that the the wealthy have all have all the money. And he's like, and his brother's like, yeah, and we're superheroes and could like do something about that. And he's like, no, that's not the code. <laughs> he's like, the code, the code. You'd want us to seize political power. That we're not supposed to because of the code. And he's like, well, you know, World War II happened when we had superpowers, and I really wish we would have stopped those Nazis sooner. And he was like, yeah, but the code! So he's, he, he's talking to a brick wall. He's talking to a brick wall, and then he says, uh, just point blank, like, next time I won't stop. Or something <laughs> to that effect. And it's just, like, so very clearly, like, uh, oh, he's a bad guy. He's going to be a bad guy. Next time, they won't be spared my wrath. Yeah, it's, I don't know. It's just uh, dumb. Um, but also, like, I, I like I have to believe that the twist is going to be that this code is, like, the reason that he has his powers or something. Because it doesn't make any sense for this dude to follow this logic that rigid, rigidly. 
unless he's like truly like compartmentalizing like his trauma or something. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like to to not stop. It, it also is just like, um, and this is probably more of a them adapting the comic book thing than the show itself, a fault of it. But like, it's such a lazy way of being like, there's superheroes, but the world hasn't changed really. Because, because there's a you, code. Add in, you add in like there's a Superman equivalent, and he was around for World War II, and then why didn't he just kill Hitler? Oh, because he doesn't kill. Okay, why didn't he stop the Nazis then? Well, he, he doesn't. He doesn't get involved in the pol in the political the political world. He he's an uh, he's an icon, not a he he inspires change. He doesn't directly deal with it. And what what does he do? Like you see, he goes out and like he fights crime. Yeah, I don't know. They don't establish it. They don't establish what he does. They just have him say that he inspires change. He doesn't directly cause it. You know, I guess fighting because, crime would actually be directly causing change. Yeah, uh, going out and uh, beating up a uh, bank robber is is a uh, it's gonna have um, like systematically is gonna have a, a political effect, right? Yeah. Well, and his response when his brother says we probably should have like stopped the Nazis sooner is he's like, and then what? We get involved in Korea, Vietnam, and like what his brother probably should have said was, yeah, yes. We could have stopped those, too. Yeah, I don't know. Like, the thing about this discussion, this dialogue you're spelling out, this kind of disagreement is actually, is interesting if they just fleshed it out, right? Right. Well, all you have to do is show that there's a complete diff, like, the, that this has been a conversation that these two have had before, and that it's clear that, like, this is just another edition of their continuing conversation of their two ideologies. But they right, don't really do it like that. They just make it a vaguely political thing where these two are talking to each other about uh, why his moral code is so stringent. But they don't really elaborate on what the code is. And it sounds like he doesn't question what the like why he's doing the code in the first place. No, the brother is like the brother seems to, I guess, have some sort of understanding, which leads me to believe that it does have something to do with their powers. Yeah, uh, I, I, it has to be, I guess. Like, is that the big mystery of the show, maybe? I don't know. Like, uh, it, It's hard to say. I'm not going to stick around and find out, that's for sure. It's vaguely interesting, I guess. Yeah, I guess it's vaguely interesting in the same way that what you've described for Shadow and Bone is also vaguely interesting. Like, There's a core concept that could be good. Um, yeah, I, I just don't know why they went on like a, like a sailboat. <laughs> yeah well okay so there's one last big thing that we want i want to discuss here with jupiter's legacy which is that there's a final battle that is uh hilarious yeah so like <laughs> you know when you, you go on like a some websites and there's like an advertisement for something that's like a bootleg yeah oh yeah where it's like yeah i know what you mean where like yeah, instead of it, nikes it's knockies <laughs> yeah or they have a fictional character like like they have sonic but he's like green and he's got like like two spikes yeah and he's original character do not steal yeah click here to download this character that's are you saying that's what this guy black star is yes yeah so this there's this villain who there's this runner of this villain is in jail and for some reason, he gets out of jail, and they have to go fight him in this nondescript area. It was nice of the villain to show up in this wooded area to fight after escaping you mean not in the prison. Urban, not in the urban streets where he could actually cause some collateral damage? No, yeah. he. I guess he just decided, I'm heading to the woods. Um, And so, the, there's all these superheroes fighting this one guy, right? And you would think, throughout this episode, they've established these heroes, right? Yeah, obviously they did. Uh, no. I mean, outside of the family itself, none of these heroes have really been established. Well, I think one of them, uh, who dies, has appeared in like appeared in like one scene, and the rest are just like this is their first appearance, and half of them are like dead at the end. 
So they, really wanted us to, they, they wanted some on-screen deaths, but they didn't want us to actually care about them at all, possibly. Yeah, that, that really gives the uh, the that, that really gives me some sort of motivation for this battle that seems to just be happening because. Um, and I mean, like, listen, there's cool parts in this battle. Uh, the way this Dark Seed reject like tosses around the Superman is pretty fun. Uh, the way he dies is fun. It's just that like there's nothing to latch onto in terms of emotional context. Not at all. Yeah, like usually in something like The Boys, let's say, because it does feel like this scene, at least the end of it, is partially inspired by that. Uh, part of the reason that like the fight scenes work in there is, one, they're so outclassed most of the time that they're in very real danger every time they fight a superhero. Yes. Uh, and two, it's that um, we have like actual, like there's usually an emotional reason for the fight to happen. We usually know why they're fighting. Yeah, we know why they hate each other. <laughs> yeah, um, and like, I don't really. We don't really have that in this. Like, I guess, like, I know that this guy's a super villain, and these people are superheroes. But like, why? Why does he even why talk he... in this sequence? No, because it's revealed he's a clone. So I guess he clones don't talk. I don't know. <laughs> so it's revealed at the end after his son kills this guy that his his son's choice of murder. Of breaking the code actually doesn't really matter because it was a clone. That's how clones work. That's right. <laughs> Did they mean it was a robot or a clone? It was a clone. He punched it and his face fell off, so it was a clone. That's some. I gotta know more about this code because it's either a stupid, like a really stupid. Co- it must be stupid code, but like, well, <laughs> that's really stupid. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't. They don't say that he didn't break the code. But, like, it's also, does the code apply to people who have gotten the powers through, like, genetics? Evidently not, I guess. Who's yeah, enforcing well, this code? Like, I don't know. It's it's supposed to be, like, a big mystery, but it's also just, like, a, a I, don't, I, I don't know. Who cares? Yeah, it starts to lose, lose its, its air of mystery when you just realize that maybe this guy's just kind of crazy. I don't know. Yeah. And, like, that could also be interesting if you, like do it right well they, they could have easily shown that right if he's having an argument about it and he just starts getting really dogma- dogmatic about it and can't answer simple questions that's how you can show that it's just a dogma right exactly or he could be like well, why are you following this code exactly he's just like i follow it because it's the code it's the code exactly you could like, do that oh. you could have the scene with the brother like that yeah where and there's like a reluctant sigh from the brother that implies that he's had this conversation before He's like a week ago. You you seem like maybe you're realizing the, the mistake you're making, but apparently you've learned nothing. Heck, yeah, it's and like, that could be like emotional, emotional thing. The idea of a yeah. Superman who is like so intrinsically involved with his moral code that he's now actually lost the, his own sense of self. That's fun. There's yeah, something there. His family, his family deal with that, try to get him out of it, and he's just like clinging to it, and it's. Totally hopeless. Yeah, that could be devastating in a way that most most superhero show, most superhero shows would not tackle, including this no, one apparently. I, maybe they'll do it later. I don't know, but I, no I mean, hint yeah. of that right now, right? No, no hint of that right now, and it doesn't seem like it's a show that wants to do that. Um, but anyway, uh, what's your final thought on Shadow and Bone, Keo? Um. I thought it was very boring. I I thought it was one of the most boring things I've ever watched. Ooh, okay. Uh, I could not believe though that they spent all this time like hyping up this fold, and then like the reason they go to the fold is like handled in like one minute, and then they're <laughs> there. Yeah, it sounds great. Um. Uh. Yeah. It, listen, Jupiter's Legacy is another thing that has like interesting concept. There's definitely ways where this could have been a fun thing, but it's not. The costumes are bad. The writing is bad. The, um, it's just not, the story doesn't make, like, the story goes through too many hoops to try and cram stuff into it. Um, I don't know. I didn't like it. Tune out. 
Yeah, um, based on what I watched of it, I think it was a tune out, although it was funny. Like, if it was a comedy, this could have worked really well. Yeah. Yeah, just make it funny, you know? As like a parody of like a CW show, it could have been funny. It could have been really funny because it was un- it was unintentionally funny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The best kind of funny. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that's a tune out on Jupiter's Legacy, and I guess on Shadow and Bone. Yeah. Um, I, I'm gonna just confidently say here that I disagree with the <laughs> critics. At least on the first episode, maybe it gets better. Episode two. Yeah. Sometimes you have to watch more than one episode of something to get uh, the experience out of it. It's definitely and, a rule for anime. Yeah, I mean, and that is the general flaw of TV tuners. But that's why we do what we do. You know, we're not like, we're, we're, you know, that's why we're a step above the rest. And yeah, we do less work than the rest. That's right. Making us better. Um, but hey, that's it for this week's episode of the show. Uh, stay tuned. We've got more uh, Buy Me a Coffee epi- bonus episodes coming your way. We're still doing our Gilmore Girls series. Uh, and if you want to request a future bonus episode, you can do that by going over to buy me a coffee slash TV tuners. One coffee gets you a single topic for us to discuss an episode, a movie, anything your heart desires. Uh, and with all that, we'll be back next week with more TV goodness until then keep watching. Bye. It's over. Hey folks, it's time for the TV Tuners Fact of the Week. Did you know that Stairmaster follows an extremely rigid and strict moral code that puts him at odds with society?